Welcome to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. My name is Will Franz, and I'm here to help you improve your training so you can have more fun out on the trails. Today, I want to talk about five common strength training mistakes that a lot of runners make when it comes to their strength work or getting stronger or being in the gym or however you want to think about it. Um, first, the quick tip is for today, since I'm trying to do those more and be better about them, is if you have big plans, then I would expect to make a big commitment. I think I posted this a little better on Instagram today is big goals require a big commitment. That doesn't mean you have to give up everything in your life. It doesn't mean you have to completely change your life, but it does mean that if you have big things that you want to achieve, then you are going to reprioritize things in your life and commit to them either very heavy in the short term or like consistently and steadily over the long term. Probably a little bit of both, depending on what your goals are. And if you want to keep whatever changes you've made, be it in fitness or whatever, then to some degree, those changes will have to be permanent. Now, it is absolutely true that building something, be it fitness or whatever, takes more effort than it does to maintain something. We know that something like strength work takes like a third to a ninth of the volume it takes to maintain as it does to build. So it's not that you need to constantly be on all the time or giving up something all the time, but if you are going to maintain your results, then it needs to be a part of your life for the long term, which is why it's not like big goals require a big sacrifice. That may be true, but it's largely that they require a big commitment if you have those goals like ongoing down the line. Now, this is a perfect thing to like lead into some strength work talk. Because if you want to get stronger and prepare in a way for races that is going to like reduce some risk of injury, etc., then that does require some commitment. It is not a like five minutes a day thing. It can be 10 to 15, depending on where you are and like what your equipment access is and where you are in your life. But it does require some level of commitment on a very regular pretty long-term basis to get stronger. So let's talk about like five ways that I see runners often, um, let's call it hamstring their, their strength training, like not get the most benefits or the most progress out of the work they're doing. And first is just don't train the upper body or don't train it hard enough. And I realize that we're runners, we often view ourselves as lungs with legs, but that doesn't mean that that's true. Like we actually have a lot of need for upper body and this is true of road runners, trail runners, etc. Like, yes, if you are a trail runner who's going to do big mountain race, you might need poles and there's a very good justification there for why you might want some upper back and some arm strength, but you need it period because the body works as an entire unit. And if something is just lacking efficiency or efficacy, then it is not going to work very well. And I do know that people get worried about strength training their upper body because they're worried they're going to get big or whatever. First, you're probably not. People put in so much effort to get big. Um, it is very unlikely that you're going to do it by accident. So give it a shot. If you accidentally get big, you can stop and it will go away or you'll stop getting bigger. So that's a pretty pretty easy thing. Two, you have to eat so much food for most people to actually put on a ton of muscle mass that you're probably not going to get there. And this is especially true if you're running a lot as well, because you're having to fuel all of this training. It is very unlikely that you are going to put on a ton of muscle mass. That doesn't mean you can't get strong. It just means we're not going to look like a bodybuilder on stage, which most people don't want anyway. So that's fine. Now, from a strength perspective, why these things matter is because your upper body keeps you upright. Like otherwise we're like very floppy. Your torso doesn't do its job. If we want to stay stable while we're running, we need the upper body to actually function appropriately. For example, there's a thing called your posterior oblique sling, which is your lat down to your glute meds. Your glute med is a muscle on your butt that like moves your leg outwards and keeps you stable. 
a lot of runners end up with some like some level of high hamstring tendinopathy and a common reason for that is that knee collapses as they get tired and they run more and some of this is just that they don't have strong enough glute med so if we don't have a strong enough glute med we can end up with some hamstring stuff and then if we don't have good communication from our lat it's this big muscle like on the side here it wraps all the way down around your back and down to the opposite glute med, then our torso gets floppy and unstable. So we should train our back. And it's not just because pulling uses your back, it's also because it keeps you stable and upright. And this is what you're working in exercises like dead bugs, where you lay on your back and you move your arms and legs in opposite fashion. This is what you work in a bird dog, as long as you're not trying to turn it into a dancer move and kick yourself in the back of the head. If we actually keep ourselves stable, then we use this posterior oblique sling in a bird dog. And this is one of the major side benefits of something like a single leg Romanian deadlift. This cross body function has to work well, or else you end up in weird rotations and your back hurts during movements like this. So we should train the upper body. Now, made a, that is the case for the back, but it also matters for your shoulders. If your shoulder does not work well, then we can't really get into muscles of your back. Because if we are ending up in this big, rounded, forward shoulder position, then we can't actually pull down with the big muscles of our back. We have to be able to stay upright and proud in order to get the lat to do its full job. To say that the lat isn't doing its job is insane. If your arm is attached to your body, and especially if it's moving downward while it's attached to your body, your lat is working. It just might not be working very well. And if we don't have very good muscle connection, then we're probably not going to build it. So this is one. This is, this is a great reason as a runner, even if you don't have other goals or don't care about anything else in your life, um, why some upper body training can be helpful because it will help you run better because you'll be upright longer. We're not going to end up in this caved over position where our lungs don't inflate as well. And we'll just be a lot more stable and more durable. And this is aside from all the ideas that I've said in the past of like, you're more than just a runner. You want to play with your kids, etc. Like this is just for running. It's an important thing. Another thing, number two, that I see people make mistakes on strength work is that we're doing too much single side or unilateral stuff. And this is this comes from often the idea that running strength training should look like running. And to some, that is arguably true to some degree. Again, you're more than just a runner. You might want to do some other stuff. But to make ourselves better at running, then our strength training should have some crossover or carryover to running. That does not mean that it should only be single side. Yes, running is a single side sport where you're pushing off back and forth, back and forth with the opposite legs, but it does not mean that is all we are doing and it does not necessarily mimic the full body movement super well. Good example for this is a like deep low bar back squat where if we look at the way we actually run, like watch Kipchoge close out um, like the Ineos two hour event. He one, his knee stays slightly bent, so he's not fully driving back with his calf, and he is getting incredible hip extension with every push-off. He drives back and just drives with his glute. His glute flexes every time. And if we look at a way that we can mimic that in the gym, it would be something like a low bar back squat, where we have the weight a little lower on our back, and then we sit back into our heels and to get out of that position, drive them forward again. This is also true of a deadlift. Currently I'm doing like hex bar deadlifts in my strength programming. This is exactly the hip drive that we create in running, although to a much like heavier degree. So if we can create some of that hip drive in the gym, be it single side or not, that has a lot of crossover to running. Our movement should all be single side is not the same thing as our movement should look like running to make us better at running. Now, just another case for squats. Just like we just talked about the posterior oblique sling, we have an anterior oblique sling, and that is your external oblique here into your internal oblique, which goes the other way on the other side, and then your adductors, the muscles that like pull your leg in. We'll often view some of these as like your groin muscles, 
or whatever. They attach from your pelvis down and like cascade down the inside of your upper leg or your femur. And that keeps you stable in the front, just like your lat to glute med connection keeps you stable in the back. And ways that we can really target those adductors, yes, we can isolate them with bands. We can do things like Copenhagen planks or side planks where we really target driving that foot down into the ground. But we can also get really low in something like a Romanian deadlift. If you are open enough in your hips and you go low enough in a Romanian deadlift, your hamstrings are going to be too lengthened to fire very well for the first couple inches, and your adductors are going to do a ton of work. And we see the same thing in a really deep squat. A lot of times, you know, if you teach someone to squat really low for the first time, if they're able to do it, don't just go out. If you currently squat above parallel, don't just go out and like go ass to grass tomorrow. We need to be able to like hold that stability and create that force without hurting ourselves. But if we can build toward this, your things like your adductors will get a lot stronger. And yes, we think about our quads, we think about our glutes. We often overlook muscles like our adductors, and it can be to our own detriment. So too much single side stuff can lead to problems because it doesn't allow us to load really heavy in a way that necessarily replicates running. Next, the third mistake I see is like people training for like shiny abs over a stable 360 degree core. Now, core or midsection is like one of the, I think, most misunderstood concepts when it comes to training, especially for athletes. If we think about our core in a 360 degree fashion, I like to think of it as like pretty much everything that connects my like rib cage down to my pelvis and keeps my torso upright. If my core isn't doing its job, I look like this. I need to be upright. If my core, if my core is doing its job, then I'm going to be upright. And this is a, it is a lot of muscles that are responsible for this. It is not just like the shiny six pack or eight pack on the front of you. It is not even just the obliques that we often target with something like a Russian twist or a cable oblique twist. It is like four off the top of my like 10 muscles just off the top of my head that I can quickly think of. And it's probably more than that. So it is 360 degrees. It includes parts of your back. It includes parts of your stomach. And it is deeper than just the things we can see. I saw someone post recently in a like respected running forum. Um, they said something along the lines of like you shouldn't brace your core when you're running. And then proceeded to talk about how like flexion, the things we create with the eight pack where we like fold our spine and rotation in the obliques, like we shouldn't be locked down in those muscles when we're running. Very true. Not the same as bracing your core, because as we run, your hips should swivel. It is part of the gait cycle. They need to move. They shouldn't look crazy, but they should have some motion to them or you're not going to actually be able to drive and generate force. Now, the core or bracing structure is actually deeper than that. And again, if I weren't bracing to some degree now, I would be side, I would be flopped over. So deeper muscles like your transverse abdominis and deeper muscles of your back, like your erector spinae, need to hold you stable and hold you in like a braced fashion or else we end up with problems. And this is one of the reasons that we can often end up with back pain if you're Pelvis is in what's called like anterior pelvic tilt, where it's tilted forward. Our low back's doing a lot. Typically, our psoas is doing a lot. And our abdomen, like the bracing structure of our abdomen, isn't doing a lot. And then we just end up over leveraged on our spine. So if we want to have, we should have some level of core bracing. We should train the deeper muscles of our core. And to do that in the front with the transverse abdominis, it can just be like heavy squats. We can also target that directly with something called like a transverse abdominus or an abdominal vacuum where you try to pull your belly button, but actually your entire like front of your midsection back to your spine. And that is a way that we can start to train that and develop a deeper connection to that. Especially if you have something like, I always pronounce this diastasis recti, where your abdomen is separated due to pregnancy or whatever, there's multiple reasons this may happen, then we want to reconnect to that and regain some connection to these muscles that actually go laterally fully around your midsection. If you flex this hard enough, you might actually feel this in your low back because that's where they connect. So that is the 
big thing about bracing. You should be bracing to some degree. You are bracing if you're standing up or sitting without a back support, and we should be able to do that well. And doing things like crunches, while they will give you a like shiny 8-pack and can be nice, they are not necessarily going to build a very stable core. So heavy lifting is important. And this is true for deadlifts as well. If we do something like a Superman, it targets like a couple small muscles in a couple vertebra right behind our back. Um, if we're actually going to train the entire structure of like our deeper back muscles, the best way you can do this is actually just put them under heavy load. So something like a heavy deadlift, a heavy Romanian deadlift, don't build, or I mean, build up to this. Don't just go out the gate and try and pull 200 pounds off the floor. Like, make sure that it is appropriate for whatever your body feels is heavy. But the way these muscles work, they actually respond more to load than they create force. So if you put them under heavy load, then they will get stronger. And if you put them under heavy load in a way you don't get injured, they will continue to get stronger. So lift heavy, Train your entire 360-degree midsection, not just the shiny muscles. Fourth mistake I see is just too much calf work. Um, we like to focus on the calves because they're easy to target. I've been guilty of this a little bit in the past. I think they're important to train. Um, that said, they do a lot of work while running. You're getting a lot of calf training anyway, just from the sheer fact that you're running along the ground and they're taking or dispersing a lot of load. You're taking a lot of load through the Achilles, and you're creating a lot of force, especially if you're running trails and going uphill. Now, if we're having calf problems, it is not necessarily a weakness in the calf. That may be a factor, but it is usually due to like a lack of function of the glutes or a lack of dorsiflexion of the ankle. The dorsiflexion is when you pull your toes up to your shin. If we can't flex the ankle enough in that direction, then we can't really use the glutes, and you will just always be using your feet and your calves all day. So if we can't get our knee very far past our toes and ankle flexion, we should try to build some flexibility there. If we can't generate force with our glutes, we should work there. And in the meantime, we might want to add some extra strength to our calf so that it doesn't get injured in the process, but it is already taking a ton of load. And usually if we're having a lot of calf problems, it comes, it is more of a symptom than the actual problem. It can be the problem, but it is much more common that it is more of a symptom than the problem. Now, finally, when it comes to strength work, one of the biggest mistakes I see across the board, and this is not just runners, although this is this community, it is most endurance athletes and many people in general, is just insufficient rest periods when lifting. Like we need to actually like sit and appreciate the rest period between your sets of work. If you do 10 squats, like try not to, you know, superset that with whatever is next on the program. Actually sit for a minute, let your body recover so you can generate more force in the next set. We need to appreciate that rest period so you will actually get stronger. If you are really pinched for time, then there are ways to string things together so you can cut the time a little bit and not necessarily take a full like, hour in the gym and still get a lot out of your session, but you will get a little more out of your strength work if we actually appreciate the rest periods. Now, if we needed to string these things together, it'd be something like a squat and then an overhead press and then maybe whatever accessory goofy bicep or core work you want to do. And that would not take as much away from like the squat and the overhead press would not necessarily take it away from each other very much because they're focused primarily on very opposite ends of the body. You would not want to pair a squat and a deadlift together because you're just not getting as much out of either of those exercises. You're damaging your progress on both fronts. So if you can appreciate the rest period and just take a pause you would be much better off to like omit an exercise entirely, depending what the exercise is. Like, don't do your arm work and instead actually take the 60 seconds of rest between your heavy leg sets and you will see a lot more progress in the gym and it will have a lot more carryover. So again, for the main, big, like, main five I thought of today were 
One, just not training the upper body. And yes, some of this is you are more than just a runner. But two, if you don't have a strong upper body, your torso gets floppy and you can't run very well. So we do want to have a strong upper body. Two is doing too much single side stuff because yes, things should look like running, but that does not mean that everything should be unilateral or single side. We, three is training for like shiny abs versus a strong 360 degree midsection or core. Crunches are great. If you want a six pack or eight pack, that's great. But the biggest thing from a running perspective is actually having a stable core that can create some level of bracing for however long you're going to run, which if you're running 100 miles, that's a very long time. So we want to have a very strong, durable core. Too much calf work was number four. And again, calves should be strong. If you're kind of newer to running and strength training in general, then it can be really important. But a lot of the time, if we've been running for a bit and we're still struggling with calf things, it usually comes from a movement dysfunction, either not firing the glutes well, not creating like by not creating enough hip extension or not having enough ankle flexion. And it is less often an issue of the actual calf itself. And then finally, just not taking enough rest periods when lifting and trying to superset everything into a circuit. This is one of the big reasons why I'm not a huge fan of many class structures when it comes to endurance athletes. If that's the only way you're going to get some strength training in, great, like go do the thing. But you will get much better progress if you do some strength training that appreciates and respects the rest period. So those are the five I had for today. I hope that was helpful. I'm going to probably do some of these a little more midday, depending on the schedule, just because I'm trying to get more of these in a week, and it has been a constant battle with me fitting it in. So I hope you have a great rest of your day. I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comments. I'd love to answer them, and have a good rest of your Tuesday, and I'll be back with another one of these soon. Thank you for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. Honestly, I'm still surprised and honored that anybody wants to hear what I have to say, so thank you. To be clear, not a doctor, nor a registered dietitian, or any other kind of medical professional. I'm a personal trainer, a nutrition coach, and a running coach, and I have a passion for training trail runners. You should always speak with a qualified medical professional before making any changes to your training or nutrition program. If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please take a second to leave a rating or review. I'd really appreciate it. Or you could just share it with someone for whom you think it might be helpful. I make these kinds of things in order to provide more quality, free resources to people, so the more people who hear it, the better. If you want more of this information, please head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook, where we discuss all aspects of training, so you can have more fun doing the sport that you love. Thank you again for listening.